this has been a magnificent day. One of the things that's closest to my heart has been to get this library actually on the road to construction. We're on that road. This birthday celebration has been a magnificent one. As a celebration for that birthday, there are the results of good wishes. There's $53,000 in checks in that pile of papers right there. They didn't come with the expectation of getting something in return. They were making a contribution to the educational, sec uh, ed educational welfare of this section of the country. I had nothing to give them. I'm a has-been, out of office, and I couldn't get a fellow a job as dog catcher in any place at all. <laughs> yes, there we are. And the beautiful thing about that is those checks run from a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, fifteen dollars, twenty-five dollars, fifty dollars, seventy-one dollars, some of them a, a thousand, and some of them even bigger than that. But the vast majority of that collection there is in small amounts comparatively. And that means that everybody will have a book or two in that library or a stone or two. The chef here in the hotel told me that he was much faster workman than the contractor for he'd already built the library and presented it. <laughs> That's a beautiful cake. But I can't tell you how very much I appreciate what you've done. It's a magnificent thing. And there's no way in the world that I can make you feel that you have the appreciation to which you're entitled. It's a magnificent thing, something that never happens to a man while he's alive. But we've set a precedent for many a thing, and this is just another one for which I'm very grateful. <laughs> I appreciate it. There's any, nothing I can say to you that will add to what you already know you've done. And you know how I feel about it, and I haven't the words to express it. Thank you very much. And I hope that those that are to come will have for you chiefly health, that you may enjoy them. You know, you are not only a president in your own right, but you are a maker of presidents. You made me president of the Truman Library, <laughs> and seven years ago today, when you signed the reorganization bill of the American Red Cross, of which I was then the national chairman, you made me, as incredible as it may seem, the first president that the American National Red Cross ever had. And so you can see how pleased I was tonight when I came in and this audience sang, Happy Birthday, Mr. President, I assumed me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in my way of defining public speaking, Principle is synonymous with brevity. The privilege of representing one's fellow citizens at this birthday dinner would be great enough honor for a Missourian. But to ask a Kansan to come jayhawking over to Missouri <laughs> on such a peaceful mission transcends all historical logic and must be due only to Mr. Truman's well-known tolerance and his determination perhaps to extinguish once and for all any residual embers of the border unpleasantness of the 1860s. <laughs> I suppose still another reason for my participation and that of my academic colleagues as well relates to the feeling on the part of some that a library bears a relationship to a university, perhaps even as much as a football team. <laughs> Whatever the reasons, however, 
I am delighted to be present to pay my respects to our distinguished neighbors, and particularly on the day of the start of the project so near to his heart. This afternoon, the turning of a spade full of earth set in motion a chain of events which will culminate in the opening of a great repository of material crucial to the understanding of our time the Truman Papers. For this accomplishment, the American people have many to thank. The thousands who by their contributions, large and small, made possible the construction of the building. The City of Independence, the National Archives, close friends and co-workers of Mr. Truman. And most important of all, the well-developed sense of history which he possesses. From the beginning, I am sure that he, more than anyone else, has been able to visualize the stream of historians, political scientists, and just plain citizens, to whom the library will become a sine qua non in any effort to measure, put into perspective, and assess this complex part of the complex century. Mr. Mayor of Independence, and these distinguished guests. Uh, I'm in a very, very bad position. I've heard uh, all these distinguished gentlemen this afternoon and tonight tell you things that I just don't believe myself. <laughs> But it certainly is most satisfactory to hear them. <laughs> I've heard all the rest on the other side of the fence. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good for you. Whenever you get to the point where you think you're as good as these people say I am, somebody ought to stick a pin in the balloon <laughs> let you know that that just doesn't happen. Now, I'm highly honored with what's taking place here today. The objective, of course, is an educational and cultural one for this section of the world. And when such men as uh, President Ellis of the University of Missouri and Chancellor Murphy of the University of Kansas and Father Van Akron of Rockhurst College and the Archbishop of this diocese and uh, my good friend Rabbi Meyerberg. Uh, the United States has five jobs, any one of which is an all day and all night job for one man, yet he has to do all five of them. I had to have some official warriors on that job and one of my official warriors was the chairman of the National Democratic Committee at that time. His name is Frank McKinney. He's sitting right over here. <laughs> Democratic Party now has another official warrior in the form of Chairman Butler who's sitting over here. <laughs> I had the uh, uh, faculty for passing my troubles to the people who were that who made up the White House family. Uh, whenever I got into a, any sort of trouble in the State Department or the Treasury Department or the legal uh, things that faced the uh, United States government or with the Interior Department or the Post Office Department, I'd just call in the, this secretary who was in charge of that and say, this is what's happening. Uh, I think it's an un insoluble problem, but you solve it and tell me the difficulty, and they'd lose all the sleep, and I always slept very well. <laughs> when I came home, I had to have an official warrior take care of my worries here at home, so I picked Tom Evans over there. <laughs> <who's been laughs> He's got a good job. Now, I could go through this audience in that way and tell you something about everybody that's sitting here. I've had associations with nearly every one of them. Honor this occasion with their presence. I cannot refrain 
in this closing moment before the benediction. I just cannot refrain from saying to you what I think every man and every woman in this great banquet hall tonight would want said. And that is that we're very grateful for your life and for all that you have meant to America and to a world that was filled with chaos and turmoil and strife on every hand. We're very grateful for everything that you have done to help make America strong. We're very grateful for the friendship that you have extended so genuinely and so sincerely to humble men and great men alike. We're very grateful that you have in your heart a desire to make available to students I'd rather do, I think, what you're doing. I'd rather think and feel. I'd rather think that here today we're in the heart of America, in the heart of the great America, with Americans. I'd rather think that we're here because we're interested in something that's good for the people now living and something good for those to come. That's the essence of this proposition. That's our real interest in it. But we can't help but feel emotionally that in addition to that, we're here to honor one of the great men this country has produced. A man that caused our being here today a man who is honored in this, whether he wishes to be or not. A man who led this country for eight years, 
through its most troublesome and yet its most fascinating and interesting period. And I'd like to feel with you that this is the kind of thing Americans do and can do so well. Give them a righteous cause. Give them something good for humanity. Give them leadership such as we have always had in President Truman, and they never fail to respond. He's associated in every way with his career. We are today building, beginning a foundation that at once will be a memorial to a distinguished statesman, a museum of great value in public education, and a library of enormous usefulness to scholars of American and world history and politics. Here will be collections of the arts, mementos of official, uh, of official and private life, replicas of a national shrine, the executive office in Washington, all intimately connected with the destiny that brought the man from independence to a position of leadership in the greatest nation at a gigantic crisis in world history. The man from independence, his personality, his work, and his fame will all be enshrined here in an American institution combining a museum with a great research library. Fortunately, it will contain a complete set of his papers. This set will not be destroyed by the unwise descendants as one president's were, or by fire as were another's, nor will they be permanently damaged by the separation of the so-called personal from the official papers as were Thomas Jefferson's by an unwise Congress, nor will the tr these treasures be kept hidden from historians for many years, as have been still others. One cannot overestimate the importance for scholarship for which I speak of a collection of papers complete as to the leader and extensive as to the times. Some <laughs> the 10th anniversary of my succession to the Presidency of the United States. Tuesday, April the 12th, 1945, was a very sad day for me and for my whole family, as well as for all the members of Mr. Roosevelt's cabinet and staff. I remember very distinctly the ceremony at which Chief Justice Howland Stone swore me in. It was a very solemn occasion and was a very great surprise to me because I had hoped that Mr. Roosevelt was well on the road to recovery. He had told me when he left for Warm Springs, Georgia, that he had a cold and would soon whip it at Warm Springs. As soon as the ceremony was over, I held a meeting of the cabinet, and the business of the government continued under my direction immediately. You all know the history of the period from April the 12th 1945 to January the 20th, 1953. I'm going to explain it more completely and thoroughly as soon as I can finish the book I'm now working on. I would have been much happier if I could have served out the term as Vice President and probably have gone back to the Senate from the great state of Missouri. Since I left the White House, I have endeavored to enter into the life at home here as I followed it before 1935, before I went to the Senate. Coming back home has been a most pleasant experience and a most happy one. I expect to continue the program which I have started and hope eventually, due to the experience I have had, to be able to add something to the information of the young people who are now coming of age.
fine. Third, uh,